Hello, it's time for another Teal Tinted Glasses. Tonight, we'll talk about some coaching changes in the NHL. We're also going to talk about the Edmonton Oilers as we bring our What's Next series back to the West Coast. And, well, not, I mean, the West Coast as far as conference and whatever. Um, it's me, it's Jerk, it's going to be epic. Here we go. All right, but before we get into things, as I screw everything up as usual, if you want to be a part of the show, hit us up in the chat, uh, talk to us on Twitters, the YouTubes, wherever, you know, we like to talk to you, you know where to find us if you need us. Um, again, that's it, it is what it is. Wow, this is just off to a brutal start yet again, but it's okay, because we will save it, because it is me, it is Mr. Hockey Jerk, uh, I have no names under our names, so that's fine, they, people know who we are. I mean, that's, you know, if you don't know who we are, welcome. <laughs> welcome. Uh, but also. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I'm just, I'm totally botching it. <laughs> All right. This is over. This show is done. All right. Whatever. You're going to have to deal with nameless me. It's because actually what happened was, was, uh, as you may notice, Kevin Lacey is not here with us tonight. So, uh, what I did was, uh, Puck guy in his awesomeness, infinite awesomeness, hooked us up with like a new image, like right before we were going live to kind of keep up with the theme of jerk having shirts for the team that we are talking about. And uh, yeah, uh, I mean, complete amateur hour here, but uh, I didn't remember to add the names quickly before we went live. I wanted to actually get on the, sh the air at 10 o'clock for once because I feel or, or seven o'clock for most of you, uh, because I feel <laughs> like TTG is always like notoriously like 10 minutes late. And I was like, oh, no, we're going to do it this time. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. Um, but yeah, uh, here we go. Here we are. Um, I'm just going to make sure that everything is working correctly here as we get on with things. Look at that. The YouTube comments are working. It's not a complete disaster. Um, Hockey Jerk, how are you this evening? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm fantastic. I uh, had a good Father's Day. Uh, nice. <laughs> good Tiger. <laughs> the gear jersey. It's at because the Oilers gears are about to fall off. We will discuss that tonight. And you'll find out whether or not we agree with that assessment. Um, but before we start, Jerk, on the Edmonton Oilers, because I think that's what we're going to get to at some point, um, we had some coaching changes uh, in the NHL. Um, I want to start, before we get into the ones that actually happened, It's it's the word is coming down that Peter DeBoer is likely to be the next coach of the Dallas Stars. Elliot Friedman posted this about a few minutes ago uh, on the Twitters. Um, what do you think about Peter DeBoer in Dallas? Well, I, I think we had first heard about this uh, maybe a week ago, um, you know, one of those things where it was trending in that direction, but nobody really wanted to talk about it. And now it seems like it's going to be official, um, maybe late tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I've, after his run with the Sharks, I, I was very uninterested in anything that Peter DeBoer had going on. And then obviously he gets the job in Vegas. And, you know, I thought he did a well enough job there. But, you know, the way that he kind of messed with Marc-Andre Fleury, you know, and then the way he messes with Robin Leonard out the door, it's just it, it's hard to say, hey, glad you're back on your feet. You know what I mean? It's I, I'm just waiting. Like, who's like how soon? You know, I, I know obviously that Dallas is kind of in transition, and I understand that. But at the same time, it's like, how soon before Jake Ottinger is losing starts to whoever? You know what I mean? Like, how soon before, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, this has really worked, but uh, that's a young player. He's under 23 years old. I don't want to play him in a good spot. You know, it's just, it's going to be more of the same nonsense, if you ask me. So I. I don't know. I'm sort of just setting my watch until Dallas fires him. I'll be totally honest. But at the same time, if you want to get into the uh, the juiciness of it all, uh, DeBoer coaching Dallas, uh, as we know, you know, the uh, the man that nobody can seem to let go. Joe Pavelski is obviously on Dallas. Maybe maybe Brent Burns looks at that and says, huh, you know, I like those guys. Maybe uh, maybe I should be traded there. I don't know. That's just a conspiracy theory. 
Yeah, I don't, I, I'm not going to lie. I don't really like this move for Dallas. I don't think Dallas is in a place where I think, I think Peter DeBoer is a mediocre coach, but I think his mm-hmm. best, his best thing to, the, the team that you want to put him on is a veteran team. Yeah. A team like Vegas, a team like the Sharks when he first came here, right? right. A team that has all the pieces and he just needs to crack the whip and make it work for a year or two. I think the thing with DeBoer is he like he's a much different coach from, you know, your standard cookie cutter NHL coach. Mm-hmm. And I feel I feel like people when he first gets hired somewhere wherever that is, I feel like people tend to appreciate that, you know, the players they say, "Oh, this guy is completely different from what we've had. This is awesome." And then as the years go on, you know, the deficiencies really start to come out and by the end I mean, you know, he either burns the bridge or the guys can't stand him, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't like this because I, I, I agree. I Like, Dallas, to me, is a team in transition. This isn't a team that, to me at least, should be like, oh, we got one run left in us. Because nothing <laughs> yeah. that we saw in the playoffs. Now, granted, they, you know, it, they, they did play a good team, but nothing we saw in the playoffs like says, like, oh, yeah, this team's just, you know this team's a piece away from another run. Like, I don't know. I, I well, think and, Dallas is a sham. And it's been that way for a while. I mean, even when they went to the final during the bubble, mm-hmm. nobody was really into what they had going on at all. No, they were, no. they were the, I can't believe you're here team. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the bubble had a lot of those. <laughs> no kidding. But you know, and obviously they got hot at the right time. You know, Hudobin was playing very well back yes. then. But even going back to 2020, they've been that team in transition that's, you know, as we like to say, a piece away from being a piece away. And I don't know. I just feel like, yeah, like this year was actually good. You know, I, I, I think this year they made a, a lot of steps in the right direction. You know, and I'm, I, I, a little bit of an uh, inside baseball here, but I, I, I think. Dallas will be a what's next team down the road. But, you know, but while we're on the subject, you know, I thought their young players made a big step and we say they're a team in transition, but they've, they've actually started the transition. Right. And so I am generally speaking, I am curious to see where they go with that. Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, As we ride the carousel to the next city, obviously Peter DeBoer's last team was the golden Knights and, Mm -hmm. So let's ride the carousel over to Vegas, um, where you currently are. Uh, True. And Bruce Cassidy is uh, now the head coach of the Vegas Golden Knights. What are your thoughts here? What's what's the what's the feeling uh, down on the down on the street? <laughs> well, you know the uh, you know I I, I went to uh, uh, I went to the the Park MGM Casino, which is you know the one right next to the arena, and you know I asked I asked my craps dealer. I said, hey, how do you think how do you think Cassidy's gonna deploy Petro? And and he said, who's Petro? So, you know, uh, kind of tells you what you, <laughs> what you need to know. Um, but I think what stands out to me about Bruce Cass- Cassidy specifically is he was out of a job for six days and twenty two hours, yeah. and Vegas, and you know. All the accounts out there were saying, oh, Vegas is going after Trotz. Vegas is going right. after Paul Maurice, Rick Tockett, you know, because Rick Tockett lives here, you know, so mm-hmm. seemed kind of like an obvious decision. And then Bruce Cassidy becomes available in Vegas, <laughs> as they usually do, they identify what they want and they go take it. Um, I like the hire. I mean, Bruce Cassidy, he's he's relatively inexperienced when it comes to being a head coach. I believe Boston was his first head coaching job, Mm -hmm. but the type of team that he's coming from to the type of team he's going to very similar style. You know, they have kind of a mix of older players and younger players, but a lot of, a lot of established guys, you know, guys who maybe, maybe they've not won a Stanley cup, but they've been around for a while. And, and, you know, it's not a, not a totally brand new team. And, and, you know, as we've seen in Boston, you know, Cassidy, he does have a habit for getting a lot out of certain players. And so you look at this Vegas team who, granted, injuries this year, I understand it, but they seemed like they were always a goal short this year. And with a coach like Cassidy, maybe you can get a couple drops, a couple more drops out of the orange. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think it's the, I, I really think he's like the perfect coach for Vegas. And yeah, he got a lot of money too, but <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. 
Like I think I think he's probably the perfect coach for Vegas, which obviously as a Sharks fan doesn't make me feel all warm and fuzzy. But I think from an anal like if you're looking at it from just like is this a good hire for Vegas? It's an amazing hire for Vegas. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that pro like I I just wonder if he lost the room in Boston. Yeah, I I think. I mean, there's kind of a couple things at play. You know, there for some reason Bruins folks have been, you know, talking the word rebuild, which I don't really understand. And obviously, mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's a lot of mystery uh, with Patrice Bergeron, and you know, a couple guys are going to be injured. Obviously, Grizzlick is hurt, Merritt, Brandon Carlo is hurt, and so you you're not going to see a 100% Boston Bruins team going into next season. But I don't. I don't know that that means you need to fire the coach in a completely different direction. You yeah. know, I mean they I mean they signed, you know, they signed Taylor Hall, they brought in a lot of guys. They brought in Nick Felino, they brought in Eric Halla, Tomas Nosek to really kind of extend that window and it seems like they've already abandoned ship. I mean, they traded for Hampus Lindholm, signed him to a 7-year extension. Yeah. And now they're rebuilding, I guess. They'll, I mean, they, they'll knowing them like they'll just, you know, They'll just suck for a year, get Bedard, and then go back to their normal selves. Well, yeah, and I and I remember they did that a few years ago. Like I remember they took, I want to say it was a year or two uh, that they were kind of out of things. You know, they picked up uh, they picked up McAvoy, they picked up Pasternak, and then it seemed like they were just right back in it. Yeah, the, the reason I feel like because I, I, and again, I, this is me, and I talked about this. I don't know, it was a show with probably with Puck guy. And my, like my thought is just with the way that he was told like he was safe and then right. he suddenly wasn't like to me that screams I lost the room because w- he's obviously a very well regarded coach but if you go into your in- exit interviews with your players after talking to the coach and they all say no I'm done with this fucking guy yeah right like to that so that's what I wonder what happens I know that like. A lot of the the discourse on Twitter was really interesting after he was fired because a lot of there it was really it was really mixed, right? Like some guys said like, you know, they really liked him, but other guys said like he really chafed like with the young players a lot. Mm-hmm. Um and I mean Jake was it Jake DeBrusque was asking for a trade, right? Yeah. So I wonder if that you know, and again, I'm just inferring here. I don't I don't have any inside knowledge, obviously, but I just to me if you put all those pieces together to me, it says he lost the room. But I think for Vegas, on the other hand, like this is a team that is, you know, again, a veteran laden team. Um, Yeah. They're going to have to probably, you know, put some younger guys into this lineup to make the cap work, but you know, or or maybe not because they just traded for Shea Weber's contract. So LTIR for the win. (laughs) Which I think that was as an aside, like I know, Mm -hmm. You know, we we tend to grade trades as like, oh, okay, that team won this trade or that team lost this trade. But like this, that trade specifically for me, I was like, I was really kind of like, yeah, that's that's to me, that's Vegas being like, oh, this is what we need to do. Okay, done. They were just aggressive and they made, I would say, a perfect move because you clear out Dadnov's five million Mm -hmm. and enable yourselves to go seven million over the cap. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, a, you lose you lose a really good player. There. Totally. I mean, yeah, Dad Dadnov is a good player, but I, I I think ultimately re-signing Riley Smith was more important. Yep. And I think I know the free agent class is pretty thin this year, but maybe you it think it looks amazing some... until you until you realize like both of these guys aren't going anywhere. Right. But, you know, maybe, you know, maybe Vegas thinks that they can get somebody who gave them what get what Dadnov gave. Yeah. Maybe they can find that in free agency. Maybe they have that internally. I'm not totally convinced that they have it internally. Um, but I mean, Vegas was really injured all of last year. Like they have by design. <laughs> so they say people are saying, <laughs> but, you know, I almost wonder if they don't even need Dadnov because like they're 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 really good top players are going to be healthy and will be able to actively participate. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I, I, I like it. I, as, as a Sharks fan, I hate it obviously, but I think as sure. like, as it, looking at it uh, from an impartial view, I think it's a, it's, it's a great hire. Um, and as I, and as I said too, fi- which how often do you see a coach get a five-year deal? That's true. Yeah. 
I feel like coaches almost exclusively get three, you know, two years with an option or just three years straight up. Mm -hmm. So to get five years and, you know, four and a half million dollars a season, he's definitely on the higher end of coaches payroll. So that tells me that obviously if you hire your coach for five years, that means GM like that George McPhee and McCrimmon are next, right? When the next heads need to roll, they're the heads that get to roll. I mean, to me, that's what it says. I mean, you don't. I <laughs> we always say coaches are hired to be fired, right? It's true. But, and I and I feel like you could say this to any coach who's hired, but I feel like for a head coach, knowing what sort of happens with them, if you're going five years, I think you're hoping that he sticks around those five years. You know what I mean? Like it's not a situation of we well, yeah, we'd like to have him, but if we have to fire him, we'll do it. Where I don't, I don't think that's an option. You know, I think Vegas is looking at last year as a lost year, you know, an anomaly. And and this is kind of the sign of, you know, I mean, they got an elite coach for five years. I look at that as they see themselves as competitive for five years. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, as well, they should be. Um, All right. So uh, going back East, uh, John Tortorella is the new head coach of the Philadelphia Flyers. (laughs) You know, Similar to Pete DeBoer, I think when he first gets somewhere, mm-hmm. he's really good at rallying the room, you know, and, and, and he's very different. And so people tend to gravitate to that. But as time wears on, you eventually get sick of him. The exception being, uh, you know, Cam Atkinson, who's in Philadelphia now and is evidently psyched that he's going there. Um, but Brandon Dubinsky made no secret of how he felt about it, uh, you know, with his tweet. Mm-hmm. I I don't know. I mean, again, with Tortorella, say what you want about him. He's similar to DeBoer as, you know, he's a he's a veteran coach. You know, he's a guy who comes in when you're right there. You know what I mean? You're right on the cusp of being, if not a Stanley Cup team, at the very least a competitive playoff team. And I don't see that for Philadelphia at all. Like, you know, to their credit, they've been able to, squeak into a first round here and there with a brutal roster but like this is it like if you ask me philadelphia is going to be below the basement for years and so the tortorella hiring doesn't really make sense for me just on that principle before i get into my thoughts on this i do have to highlight skyler two dollars for uh super chat thanks skyler yes but how does this affect the maple leafs doesn't affect the Maple Leafs, and here's the reason: because they're still on the the greatest hypothetical run of all time. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. But we do appreciate Jeez. the super chat donation. So here here's the thing with Tortorella for me. I think like I do kind of like this hire, and I'm gonna tell you why. Because Philadelphia needs a couple of things to go super right to get somewhere back to you know even just trying to compete in the Metro, which I still think is an absolute gauntlet. One. <laughs> right. Carter Hart's going to be so much better next year. And whoever, like, I think their goaltending is going to get significantly better because their defense is going to get significantly better. Mm -hmm. The defense that the Flyers played in front of Martin Jones and Carter Hart was absolutely atrocious. And I don't know where the goals are going to come from, but I think they're going to be a significantly better defensive team. I wonder if a guy like Ivan Provorov gets a second life under a guy like Tortorella. Yeah, it could be. I mean, similar, obviously they're a bit different, but you know, Tortorella was able to get quite a bit out of Zach Wierenski. Mm -hmm. And so you maybe wonder to your point, if you get the same thing with Ivan Provorov, obviously there was conversations that Provorov was going to be traded. And, you know, meanwhile, Ristolainen is getting a five-year extension, but, you know, whatever. Uh, I just, I don't know. You say the defense is going to be better this year. I'm not so sure. I'll I think structurally they'll be better. Yeah, structurally, but I'm just their personnel. I'm not over overly Fair. fond with. I mean, yeah. especially if Travis Sanheim goes out the door. Especially if Ivan Provorov goes out the door. And I, you know, I I'm inclined to agree with you that Carter Hart will see a bounce back. But these last two years have been really hard for him, and so yeah. You know, it not to say that he is the next Martin Jones, but you know, the the data would maybe make you think, okay, you had two good years, now you've had two bad years, like where are we going from here? You know? Yeah. 
I just, I think it's just, I, the defense in front of him has been so atrocious. Like, you just... Oh, it totally has been, for sure. Like, I don't know. And I Ryan, feel like... Ryan Ellis will be healthy, too. Yeah, yeah. That's that, that's another thing, too. And I think um, if... I think that's, for that reason alone, like, I wouldn't trade Provorov. I'd keep him around. Because, one, the guy you got to play with him didn't play with him last year. <laughs> right. And, two, like, I think... I still think Carter Hart's really good. I think that mm-hmm. under, a, like, a more sound structural system that that John Tortorella is going to employ, I think they'll be better defensively. Where are the goals going to come from? I don't know. Yeah, that's, I mean, oh, I mean, we, you know, friend of the show, Cam Atkinson, but mm-hmm. as, as good as he is and, you know, as good as, as good as he's been, you know, he, he led the Flyers in goals last year with 23. Like he, you're going to need more from him. Right. And, Konechny had it down here. You're going to need more from him. Joel Farabee, Jesus, you're going to need more from him. Yeah. So much more. And, and, and you know, it's time for, you know, the, the youngish players that they have to take another step forward. You know, Morgan Frost, who everybody was really psyched over, and it's not really I gone that way Morgan for them. Frost, but, yeah, no, he, he has not lived up to the expectations. That guy could right. like, that guy could just score buckets of goals in junior, and it just hasn't translated yet, unfortunately, for him. And I love the player i mean i've watched morgan frost play so many games yeah and and, um, and owen and owen Tippett as yep. well you know that's i mean he they got him in the Giroux deal and he was supposed to be you know like the reclamation project so to speak and i don't know he wasn't i mean he was decent but not what everybody myself included thought he would be coming out of junior you know what i mean yep. yeah so it, there's a lot of guys it, there's a lot of guys who need to bounce back there's a lot of guys who need to take take the next step forward and there's a lot of guys who probably should just not be on this team anymore <laughs> yeah i mean to me the problem with the flyers isn't behind the bench well it was behind the bench last year i don't think mike was worth anything but i think probably the worst coach in the league i would say i would be curious like i just i think their problems are in their front office sure like and oh, I yeah. think until that gets sorted out, I don't know how. Like John Tortorella is a very on-brand hire for this team. <laughs> I will give it that. Um, I think, like I said, will they be better defense? They should be. Um, but is it going to be enough to make the playoffs in the Metro? Not a chance. Not a well, chance. And it, like, I don't know. To to your point, it it is a lot of the front office. That is the issue, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, you look, you know, Bobby Clark, three-time, <laughs> three-time general manager of the team, yep, and he got a promotion. Mm-hmm. Paul Holmgren, general manager of the team, who was notoriously awful with the free agent signings, he's still with the team, got yep. a promotion, and 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 you know, Chuck Fletcher, I think, is a decent general manager, but when when the when the staff above you is poison, there's only so much you can do. Yep. Yeah, I agree. All right. So that's uh, that gets us off the and, uh, coaching. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Real, real quick, if anybody's interested, uh, John Tortorella, four-year deal as the Flyers head coach, $4 million a year. Okay. So, again, on the, uh, on the higher end of coaches, I would argue. <laughs> like a tiger with a great comment here. The... Uh, the front office revisionism from Bobby Clark on Makar was absurd. I absolutely agree. Oh. I have said that many times on this show. Yeah, dude, dude. If if I were the director of, of amateur scouting for the Sharks, I would have simply not taken Nick Petrucci. I would have just simply not done it. Yeah, yeah. of course not. No, no. All right, so that brings us to the Edmonton Oilers. Uh, the Edmonton Oilers obviously just eliminated in the conference final in a four-game sweep against Colorado. Uh, and uh, should I just give like the complete rundown here, Jerk, or how do you want to do this? Yeah, rip it. Okay, so the uh, total cap dollars for uh, the Edmonton Oilers going into next season is about seventy-five million, uh, seventy-five three hundred sixty-nine hundred and thousand or seven. Yeah. Oh my god, I can't read numbers. Let's just say seventy-five million, and we'll do there, which gives about seven million dollars in cap space, seven point one million dollars in cap space. Uh, they're pending UFAs. Uh, Josh, Josh Archibald, uh, one point five million. Um, Derek Brassard, uh, Evander Kane, 
Colton Sevier, Kyle Turris, Brett Kulak, uh, Chris Russell, and Miko Koskinen, who obviously bolted to Europe. Um, pending RFA's no arbitration right would be a one Ryan McLeod, who I thought had a really good playoff run. Uh, he's currently making $834,167. And the pending arbitration eligible RFAs, and I think this is going to be fascinating because... Uh, Jesse Pugliarvi, uh is arbitration eligible and is get, and made $1.75 million last year. And Keller Yamamoto, uh, $1.124 million. Um, in LTIR, they still have Oscar Clefbaum uh, counting for $4 million in the LTIR. Uh, dead cap space. Uh, this is the last year they will be paying Milan, Milan Lucic uh, $750,000. Uh, they still have three more years of almost $2 million uh, for James Neal. And last year of a $1.5 million uh, hit for Angie, uh, Andrew Sakara. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's the um, that's that. We'll go into prospects later. Uh, we'll just focus. So a on... couple of things here for me. First of all, I think it's worth mentioning that uh, according to Cap Friendly, mm-hmm. You know, Oscar Clefbaum is on, is on injured reserve. He's not on the long-term injured reserve. And so I think that will prove to be beneficial to them. I mean, they only, as you said, 7 million and change in cap space, but yeah. uh, with, you know, with Clef bombs, $4 million going on the long-term injury, once they build that roster, they can, they'll be able to go over the cap and Correct. I'll be totally, on, I'll be totally honest with you. Like Clef bomb hasn't the last, he's missed the last two seasons. Like what yeah. are the chances he comes back? I don't and, so. and it's really unfortunate because I like Oscar Clef bomb. I think he's a good player, but yeah um I, I just couldn't stay healthy but yeah like uh, one like i remember i remember being so excited for edmonton with him because i thought he was going to help them really be the anchor for that blue line yeah well, and and you know i think as far as i can tell i believe it's the same uh it's been the same ailment that he's had for the last two years which i yeah. believe is some kind of I believe it's some kind of arthritis related yeah, just, thing. It's just not fun. Um, no, especially, especially when you're, you know, especially when you're 28 years old. I, I do want to throw this in as well because it, it is relevant. Uh, obviously, Mike Smith and Duncan Keith have been given until July 1st to decide if they're playing next year or not. Uh, important to note that if Mike Smith retires, Edmonton would still have his $2.2 million against the cap because it's a 35 plus contract. However, Duncan Keith would free up $5.538 million. Uh, so and the, if that he Duncan decides Keith to one, that and and what's interesting about that Duncan Keith one is, you know, you free up, uh, you free up his AAV, as well as I believe the first, I believe when he retires, I believe there's a cap credit that comes out of it. Yeah, I'm in not addition sure. to that. And so I'm I'm wondering if you know, <laughs> there I based on that information, it, it would make a lot of sense to me uh, as to why Edmonton would like some clarity on the situation. Absolutely. Um, I think, I mean, I'm curious your thoughts, but to me it looks like the Oilers are basically going to have to choose between Pulley RV or Yamamoto. I, I don't think they can keep both with the way the roster is currently built. Not only that, I like, and I'm curious if they even like, I mean, I guess they'd have to qualify because I think if you just let Pulley RV walk for nothing, like that's really dumb. Mm-hmm. Like I think you have to you have to qualify him and you know but if he signs his off if he signs his qualifying offer you can't move him right hmm. I I do think there's I mean to me there's got to be a trade here you know I and and I like I like Jesse Puliarvi I think he's a good player and for whatever reason he he's not been able to make it work with McDavid which is odd because everybody's been able to make it work with McDavid but I I do think his time is up in Edmonton and I know there have been some people who are well below out well below above excuse me well above our uh you know access level if you will for sure uh, who who've said who've said the same thing and so I I do wonder if there's a situation where maybe Ken Holland just goes to him and says hey you know we have to trade you you know what's your take on it and and I know some people are going to say, well, you know, he he's an RFA. You know, why are you giving him that power? But I don't know. The way I look at it is like if you include him in on it, I feel like you're more likely to be able to move him. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think 
Puliyarvi is going to get a decent chunk of change. Like, I don't think he would just sign his QO. Right. Like, I think he's going to be able to get more money than just his QO. Like, that'd be, like, the ultimate just spiteful. No, I'm, I'm just going to sign my, my $2 million QO and, you know. Right. <laughs> and you're stuck with me. Uh, <laughs> see you later, Yamamoto. Like, that would go really well. Um, Michael yeah. Blasis in the chat, uh, just complimenting the hair. Thank you, my friend. Nice. Um, yeah, I, the pull your RV thing, I think that's the, the, the real fascinating thing. I agree. Cause I think like a lot of these other guys that are coming up, like, you know, they're, they're all guys that weren't making a significant amount of money. They're all kind of just depth guys. Right. I mean, obviously mm -hmm. the Yamamoto pull your RV things. Interesting. I think, I think also obviously goaltending is fascinating. Yeah. They're, they're a team who I think probably should be sniffing around this john gibson news yeah yeah absolutely and i think because i i mean i look at this team like obviously koskinen like they're probably good riddance to him right like 4.5 <laughs> <laughs> million from yuko koskinen is insanity yeah they probably paid him to le like paid it for his ticket back to europe probably you know so i mean they're they're not gonna be they're not gonna miss there but obviously like mike smith i i mean i i don't think mike smith is terrible i just don't think he's very good either and i think if you're a stanley cup contending team like mike smith can't be your goalie yeah i agree with that and and as you said and as kevin said mike smith's not a bad goalie per se he's no. just made made a handful of blunders you know he's not he's not the guy you want as your undisputed starter and so i think you know, if he doesn't retire and he comes up in a back, comes back in a backup role, like I think that's fine. Mm -hmm. But to your point, the goaltending, that's the biggest ouchie for me, if you want to say, yeah. you know what I mean? I mean, and we always make the joke, you know, last year, Edmonton, they wanted to address their goaltending. They did it by bringing back the same two guys. <laughs> they said, this is fine. It, like literally it's, it's the, this is fine. Yeah. Thing, right. Like that, that is Ken Holland sitting there with the fire all around him. Yeah, this is fine. Um, racist fan rocks that I would not touch John Gibson. The numbers are going down. I, are the numbers going down because he's on a shit team though? I would, I would say that for the way Anaheim has really disintegrated the last four years, but also, I mean, think about, think about what John Gibson had in front of him in the ducks glory days, right? Versus yeah. what he's had now. I mean, we the ducks blue line was a farm forever theodore vatnin mm -hmm. manson montour um fowler linholm like it was a farm it was yeah and, no, it was yeah and all the and most of those guys you know with the exception of cam fowler uh are gone and so yes the team as a whole anaheim which we're way off track here but anaheim as a whole is disintegrated their blue line has also gotten much worse as well and so i i do think it is a bit of a concern that john gibson has dipped a little bit but i think on a new team on a better team i think they would see a rebound in those stats yeah and he's like race it's funny because this is the name that i was kind of going to going to segue to um as far as like edmonton and possible goaltending solutions for edmonton racist fan goes goes and says if i'm edmonton i would go Braden holpy but to me like the, i wouldn't my question was going to be like is is John Gibson's numbers bad because his team is bad or is he Braden Holtby who's just declined regardless of where he's been? Exactly. Braden Holtby has been, I mean, pretty much ever since Washington won the cup, Braden Holtby has gotten worse every year and he had a decent year with Dallas, but this is not a guy that I'm making my long-term option. Yeah. I think, you know, and maybe, maybe uh, John Gibson is the option. Maybe, maybe Stuart Skinner is the option. I know Kevin's not the biggest fan of Stuart Skinner, mm -hmm. but he did play well. And and at twenty two years old, maybe you see what's there, and then you kind of decide. Right, and that's and that and that's kind of like the interesting thing in goaltending because, obviously, like you could, you know, if if Mike Smith says he wants to go for another year, like you could easily have Stuart Skinner back him up, and, I mean. It isn't what I would do, but you could do that and then spend that extra money that you would have to do to bring another goalie in elsewhere. 
Um, I'm just going to bring up Kevin. Kevin left us kind of some thoughts because he had to bail at the last second. But I, I'm, I'm going to just read off Kevin's thoughts and then we can kind of chew on that for a second. Um, so what Kevin uh, wrote to us before the show happened, uh, he said, what I want to say about the Oilers is that the number um, that there were a number of Condors who should have made the jump after last season, Benson, Marist, etc. And they didn't yet. They had no depth this season. And that's a serious concern. They're going to have to look in free agency because they clearly don't trust the farm. I am not whatsoever sold on Stuart Skinner and their goalie of the future, Konovalov, yes, just bolted back to Russia. I don't think Mike Smith is as bad as people say, but he's not going to take them further than where they got. They are were fortunate that they played a sorry ass fragile Calgary they need to make a major league change in net so that is Kevin's thoughts uh, so I I think it's I, I I think it's interesting that Kevin says that they didn't have any depth this season and mm. and while I do agree with that I think this year was the best their depth has been in the McDavid era I agree yeah and so I agree. if they ha- if it's the best it's been and it was still not good enough. Like that just goes to show you how how much work needs to be done on this team. And you know, we we were saying Pulley RV or Yamamoto, right? Mm-hmm. Well, you've got McDavid, Drysidle. They're not going anywhere. No. Hyman's not going anywhere. Nugent Hopkins is not going anywhere. Maybe they bring up back. You know, if they bring back Evander Kane, which by all accounts they want to mm-hmm. for some reason, like that's five players right there. And so. I think the smart money would be Yamamoto fills out that six top six spot. And then so do you want to play Jesse Pugliarvi with I mean, you put him with Ryan McLeod, I think that would be fine. To your point, he had a good season. Uh and but you put him with Ryan McLeod and Zach Cassian? Yeah. You know? Like I just, I don't know, Tim and, and, and what do you trade Jesse Pugliarvi for? I don't know. But I I I mean, something, you know, maybe it's a, I don't know, maybe it's a, I, I, I don't want to use the word problem. I think it gives a bad I, idea of what I'm trying to say, but maybe like problem for problem or, you know, mm-hmm. failed experiment for failed experiment, something like that. I, Similar I just to if, Line A Dubois, that kind of thing. Right. I just wonder if like, and this is not like in a, a totally original thought because I've seen it on Twitter a lot lately. I just wonder if like they're going to move Pulley RV and then it's going to be Nachushkin all over again. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, as a Sharks would, fan, that would be amazing. I mean, cause that's the thing. Cause if that, you know, selfishly, if that happens, you know, me, you and Kevin would all be able to say, we called that one. But yeah, I, I, I do think that is, that is what going to happen. I mean, he, you know, left Edmonton, uh, because he hated Todd McClellan. And mm-hmm. I think on some level, I understand where he's coming from. And, you know, goes to Finland, plays well, comes back. And and now here's the thing. Pooley Arvey, his second run in the NHL, so to speak, which he was only gone for a year, but you get my point. Yep. It's been a lot better than his first run. For sure. And so from there, similar to Nichushkin, I mean, I didn't even make the comparable until you just said it. Mm-hmm. But now I'm like, I'm... Like, I'm, like, really, really, really into that idea. You know, went to Europe, comes back, plays better, but for whatever reason can't make it work where he's at. And, and you know, then goes God, and... I'm, just having the, I'm just having these horror stories of, like, Vegas or L.A. scooping him up as an untendered. Right, because we, we say <laughs> that, oh, it'd be great if he went somewhere else. But then, like, with our luck, he ends up somewhere else in the division, and then that, you know, comes to fruition, and it's it's crying in the club time. And the thing is, I would love – I like I said, I'm a big fan of Pulley Arvey. I would love to have him on the Sharks. Unfortunately, though, the Sharks are not in a position where they can be taking a chance on guys. No. Unless I, unless, like, unless like, you're moving out LeBanc and you're giving up on Jonathan Dolan, right. the Sharks are not in a position to be taking chances on yeah. guys. So he's probably going to sign in Vegas for 800000 and he's going to score 30 <sighs> goals and we're going to hate it. God, not Vegas. Anywhere but Vegas. <laughs> Man, God. Ugh, what a mess. I don't know. I mean, the problem, again, like earlier I talked about Philly, and this is the same thing here. Like the Oilers have just institutional rot in their front office. Like they, their whole like organization, like 
I, I really like what Jay Woodcroft did as the mm-hmm. head coach. I think he did a really good job. And I think that, you know, Todd McClellan did the best thing that he could have possibly done when he pushed him to take that job on the Condors because otherwise he would have been, you know, he'd be coaching in LA right now as an assistant coach. Right. Um, you know, and so PJ48 asking uh, the question, um, obviously, and I think this is where I want to go next, is obviously Evander Kane because Evander Kane is such a annoying yet fascinating situation. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, and PJ48 asking in the chat, if the grievance is upheld, would they still be able to move Kane for an asset or just pay him what they own for the last season? So the problem is, and this is the, the main thing that I think doesn't get stressed enough when everyone's trying to get clicks. And I love you, Shang, but goddamn. Um, is that no one really knows what's going to happen if the arbitrator rules in favor. Um, Mm -hmm. now everyone has like, there's, there's scenarios, right? And obviously one scenario is that maybe they just tell him that he's a shark again. And then the sharks pay him whatever money they owe him for last season. And they continue paying him until they, they trade him. I think, I think incredibly unlikely. Yeah. I was going to say that is, if I had to handicap it, that's maybe a 5% chance. Yeah. Like I think, I think it's super unlikely the way I, and again, no one knows anything. And I'm, and, and that's, please, please, please. This wasn't me taking a run at Shang. All right. I love Shang. I just, but he's really kind of rid this. Well, what if he's a shark again angle? And I just, to me, it just doesn't make a lot of sense. It's not personal. I just, that's the way I feel about it. Um, so to me, this is how this plays out is either a, the sharks own his money or they don't. If the Sharks owe him his money, and there's a couple ways this could go down too, right? Like if the the arbitrator might just roll, the Sharks just owe him $7 million a season. And then guess what? You're probably, that's going to have some sort of cap implication. It could be if the full $7 million for whatever, you know, he's owed. Or maybe they will do what they did with Mike Richards and they will, you know, they'll split it up and we'll be paying, they'll be paying Evander Kane for the next 20 years. Oh, at God. a much smaller amount, right? But we, mm. uh, and again, but we don't speculation. know. Speculation. We don't know. Um, but that's that the way I see it going down. I don't, I can't imagine. Like, I don't understand why this would be, this would be it. Like, how is Evander Kane being sent back to San Jose good for any of those parties? Right. Right. And that's, and that's why I don't think it's, it's, it's a very likely solution. I think, yeah, well, you know, is, could there be the San Jose Sharks owing him money either in full or less what he's making on his next contract? Sure. I could see that going either one of those ways. But I just, I don't see a situation where um, it, you know, it happens and, um, and a Vander Kane's a shark. Could it happen? Absolutely. I just don't think so. Uh, PJ48, Super Chat, $5. Thank you. Very good, sir. Uh, listen, Hustle Platner is worth $7.2 billion. If the grievance is upheld, Platner could bury him in the AHL for another season, let him stew, and then move him. I mean, Hustle Platner can pay Evander Kane's contract with the change in his couch. Um, the problem is, is even... Okay, so let's say... I don't really want to go super far down this rabbit hole, but... Let's say, just for argument's sake, Evander Kane is made a shark again. Yeah, they could shove him in the minors, but guess what? You're still counting six million against the cap while he's down there. Yep. Um, you know, you, you're. I don't know, man. I I don't want to go too deep down this rabbit hole. Yeah, Hustle Platner can pay Evander Kane. I'm not worried about the Sharks' ability to pay him. Should they have to pay him? What should wor- what should concern you as a Sharks fan is what's the cap implica- implication of paying him if they're forced to? If, right. if they lose, if they lose. Now, the Sharks could win the arbitration and then owe Evander Kane absolutely nothing. And thank God we can all stop talking about it. Here's my thought. Now, obviously, there's a lot of complexities to this. Mm-hmm. But the way I look at it is... You know, the contract was terminated uh, in January. 
right? It's, you know, mm-hmm. it's been almost, it's almost been a six month ordeal. Yes. And I said it, I said it when it happened and I'm, and I still feel this way. I think if the, if the sharks had even a sliver of feeling like they were going to lose, it would have been settlement city. Yeah. You know, if the sharks felt even there was a 1% chance they might lose, they're going to say, well, you know, how do we make this go away? Can we give you 10 million? Mm -hmm. And in almost six months that has not happened. And that makes me believe what I believed when this first all started was the Sharks think they have a pretty good case and they're willing to roll the dice on it. Yes. And, yeah. you know, the NH, the NH, and, and worth mentioning as well, a lot of people, they mentioned the Mike Richards comparable as well. Mm-hmm. But here's the thing. Back when the, with the Mike Richards situation, the Kings terminated the contract. Yes, Mike Richards was arrested and... You know, but there were other implications as well. The Kings would have been over the cap had they not gotten rid of his money. There was a, there was no due diligence or, you know, justice, so to speak. You know, it was like, oh, you're arrested, boom, terminated. Where, according to the Sharks, according to the NHL, they've done their due diligence. The NHL thinks they have a rock solid case. The Sharks obviously think they have a rock solid case. Otherwise, this would be a settlement. I don't see a situation based on the facts where Evander Kane wins. I th- I think the Sharks win, or maybe they settle just because this nonsense with the arbitrator being busy annoys them, right? Right, but, yeah, like not being able to... Because I think I, like this arbitrator thing, too, for those that for some reason lived under a rock and don't know, like they don't think the arbitrator is going to be available again before free agency starts, which... Look it, I, I'm very noted on this podcast, not a huge fan of Evander Kane, but what a crappy situation for everyone involved, including Kane. Like, absolutely crappy involved. Now, people are like, oh, we'll just get another arbitrator. The problem, here's the thing with these with these guys, right? Like, for one, this dude, like that arbitrator, this arbitrator that they've hired, these, these guys don't just work one thing, right? Like, they work lots of things, and they cost lots of money, and you work on their schedule. That's just how these things work. So I'm not outraged as as a lot of people are about, oh, this. how can they just not get a new arbitrator? Or why is this arbitrator not available? Like, that's just, that's not the way arbitrator... But, it, like, it is a poor look for the NHL, but it's just not the way these things work, ever. Well, and here's the other thing is so let's think about it you know anybody who's been involved in any kind of legal case you know they know but Mm -hmm. this case you know Kane versus sharks Mm -hmm. you know how many packets of paper belong to this damn case like (laughs) if they said hey the old guy is not available you come come be the arbitrator and uh, by the way you need to read 400 pages in two days like it's just not it just doesn't make any sense. And and I know there's been a lot of conversation of, well, you know, it's going to impact the Sharks' free agency plans by this being delayed. And I'm not so sure about that. Because it even... I mean, it, it does it does, it, it does, does it add think? a monkey wrench. Well, I mean, it, it depends. Like, if we look at the Sharks here, and I know we're getting completely off topic now, but I mean, let's take a, a look at yield Sharks cap friendly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're the Sharks, you're going into... Oh, they got lots of dreadline. Uh, they got... What do they got for space? Today's cap hit is... They've got like $5.6 million in cap space. Without Evander Kane's money on the books. Like, if you throw Evander Kane's money, they're over the cap. Correct, but I just don't see that happening. I think... I, again, I think the Sharks are going to win it outright, and they're never going to have to talk about this again. But I agree. If they settle, which to me is the only other likely option, I think it's going to be a cap penalty. Like you said, not yep. you know, it's going to be a small cap penalty, but for a lot of years, hypothetically. And you know, thinking about it like that, I don't know that eight hundred thousand dollars really jams you up all that much. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, and that's like, just a number I made up, but for sure, you, know, you get my point. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean you, but I, I think you have to be, I mean, you have to play it somewhat. Like, I agree. I, I feel like I'm very confident that the Sharks are going to win this arbitration and, and we'll laugh at all the time we waste talk, wasted talking about the, the penalty, the possibility of them not winning it. But 
I still think if you're running a team, like, I don't know, I, th- I think that has to at least be somewhat on your mind, especially oh, totally. if you're, if you're a new GM stepping into the role, mm-hmm. like you don't want the first thing that you do as you step into the roles be like, Oh, I did all this free agent stuff. And Oh no, Vander Kane's money's back on my cap. And now my first moves look like I'm an idiot. Like just way to ingratiate yourself with the fan base. Like it's just, it's such a, again, I agree. I think the sharks will be fine, but man, the potential for disaster is still pretty significant, especially as a new GM. Yeah. I, and, and, and it is, it's definitely something you want to pay attention to. It's definitely something you want to think about as you're making moves. But you know, as we both talked about, Mm -hmm. it's, I don't know, to me, it feels very unlikely that it would cause any problems. Yeah, and obviously. if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, then I'm wrong. But yeah. you know. when it comes down, we will talk about it on this show. Right, exactly. Rest but, assured. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I just I don't know. It just doesn't seem very likely to me. And and you know, at the same time, you know, the Sharks obviously have to keep an eye on it. But you know, Edmonton mm-hmm. has to keep an eye on it as well. I mean, I, I, like I said earlier, by all accounts, Edmonton wants to re-sign him. And yes, you know, whatever you want to say about Evander Kane, you know, when it came to playing hockey he obviously did that very well for them and you know the 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 interest has been put out there by Edmonton that they want to bring him back and you know that it's something they need to think about as well I mean if they you know what if what if that five percent chance of Kane becoming a shark again happens after Edmonton signs him to a deal right you know again I think that's an extremely unlikely situation but unlikely is still possible and i don't know it, it's something edmonton has to think about and i think with edmonton like looking at the cap space that they have or lack thereof like if you're a vander kane you're probably like you're 30 now you're probably looking for one more big contract i think if i think if somebody gives him more than two years i think they're stupid probably but i mean that's but is is that what you know but we've seen teams get burned by the the Evander Kane honeymoon phase before, including a team that were <laughs> the <still>. Sharks, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like we've seen this story before, and I just I'm just wondering, you know, like I agree, I I don't think I would sign him to a to a term contract. I might give him money, but I wouldn't give him term. I mean, I wouldn't sign him at all personally. Right, but me neither. Me as neither. an NHL team, like I can understand why you would. Um, I don't know, man. Like what? If you're the Oilers, like, I guess if you're Ken Holland, then you probably do it. I just wonder how much they give them and the term. Well, especially, as I said, you know, with all the money they've got tied up. I mean, it's, you know, their their big guys are the, their big guys are good. You know, I think they have a really good top six, even without Evander Kane. But, mm-hmm. you know, beyond that, like, you know, Zach Cashian. Mm-hmm. Zach Cashian's a fourth line guy and he's making over three million dollars. <sighs> you know what? I, I like Warren Fogel. Mm-hmm. And, you know, he, I think, for, you know, 26 points in 82 games uh, at just over 2 million bucks. Like, I think that's good value. But, you know, at the same time, if if Edmonton wants to be a Stanley Cup team, they're going to need more out of him. And that blue line is, the blue line is brutal. I mean, it's we, we talked about it. <laughs> yeah, we, we talked about it quite a bit this year. Um, but beyond Darnell, you know, you have Darnell Nurse, who... Is definitely overpaid, but he's good. Oh, super overpaid, you know. And 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 so Evan Bouchard obviously is signed for this year, but he's going to need a contract next year, and he's really good. Mm-hmm. And you know, Edmonton's also talking about they want to bring Brett Kulak back, which is fine. You know, I thought Brett Kulak was good for them, mm-hmm. but if you want to do that, you know, you've got, you know, you've got Duncan Keith, Tyson Berry. And Cody Cece combining for almost fourteen million bucks. Yeah, like that oh, is. Yeah. Ouch. Yeah, like that yeah. is. That's the reverse. That's the reverse. Eric Carlson, Brent Burns. Like, say whatever you want to say about those two. At least the Sharks have all the money tied up in their top pair. Yes. Yeah, that <laughs> you I know agree. what I mean. I mean, and the thing, and here's the other thing too, right? Like Duncan Keith. If you take Duncan Keith off that, right? Like, yeah, you, you get some cap savings, but then like. And, I'm, and look at Duncan Keith is not the player he once was, but 
he's still a guy who can play minutes. He's still a veteran presence on that blue line. Like a lot of the, like I'm looking at this blue line and I mean, like, you know, like the pieces that you that you think are going to be there going forward, right? Like obviously you're Darnell Nurse, who's 27 now. So he's obviously, he's not young, but he's not old either. But then he's you right look there. at Evan Bouchard, right? Mm-hmm. Philip Roberg, I, I thought he played pretty well this year. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, like those guys are like, it, having a guy like Duncan Keith on the blue line to, bring those guys along isn't the worst thing true and and you know he did play you know he he did average 19 1944 a game this year which is the lowest of his career but he's still like as you said he can still play big minutes and you know he 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 put up decent numbers from the blue line all things considered so Mm -hmm. i think if they do end up keeping him i think in a a sheltered third pairing role, I think he would be fine. Yeah. But Cody CC, I mean, as you kind of mentioned, you know, that that contract was brutal the minute it was signed. <laughs> it was, and, yeah. And, you know, and, and Tyson Berry had a, you know, last year, his first year with Edmonton was really good. But if you ask me, it very much buyer beware. And I still don't, Oilers, I don't think 4.5 for, for, for Tyson Berry is terrible, though. No, it, it, it's not terrible by any means. And I think, I, I think really what makes it easy to pile on to Barry is the fact that CC is right there too. Correct. Cause you know, cause you just, you look at all these big numbers and it's like, Oh my God, we need to get rid of it all. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, I think Keith is, I mean, Keith's got one year left. If he can do what he did last year, I think he's fine. Tyson Barry. Yeah. At four and a half, he's decent, I guess, but you got to give him minutes and you got to mm-hmm. give him time on the power play. That's the thing. Yeah. And as I said, Cody CC, God, that's, I mean, it's it's going to be, you know, this is not the team that we support, so who cares, right? Mm-hmm. But it's going to be hilarious when Cody Cece's contract prevents Edmonton from getting Evan Bouchard signed in a year. Ugh. I mean, Darnell Nurse. I love Darnell Nurse, but man, 9.25 million? What the hell? Yep. Like, I just, to me, like, that's a contract that... Like, <laughs> how 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 does Darnell Nurse make more than Leon Dreisaitl? Let that sink yeah. in for a minute. It's, and and with most big contracts, you can look and you can understand. Even if it completely blows up, you can look at the stats and you can try to understand where they were coming from. Yeah, I don't understand it with Darnell Nurse. No, you know, obviously last year. Okay, so last year he. You know, obviously it was only 56 games because of the pandemic, but, you know, over over the course of an 82 game season, you know, he he scored at a 53 point pace. So, like, that's that's really good for a defenseman. But is that nine and a quarter million good? I don't think so. And then on top of that, he scored. He did exactly what he did last year Mm -hmm. in 15 more games. So it's already the return on investment has already cratered. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I remember I remember we were in Discord one night and you were looking through, and then we were looking at Darnell Nurse and his production. You're like, "Holy crap!" Like Mario Faro is going to get paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I didn't understand it, and then I saw that and I'm like, "Oh crap!" Yeah, oh crap, he, he's going to get paid. He, 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 yeah, God no, damn you, Ken Holland. I I think with Darnell Nurse, though, I th- I don't know. Because I was about to say, well, you know, it was a down year, but it wasn't. Like, this was Edmonton's best year in the McDavid era. Mm-hmm. So, what's, you know, what's the excuse? I mean, maybe, okay, he played, he missed 11 games this year. You know, c- could that have thrown him off? I mean, maybe. But, you know, I, you would want more, like, two years ago than last year, you know? Yeah. And it, it, it's going to cause problems for them down the road. I mean, as I said... You know, they got to get Evan Bouchard signed in a year and Pulley RV and Yamamoto are f- and McLeod are free agents now. So mm-hmm. you, if you if you are going to, you know, if you are going to keep yourself married to Darnell Miller, you better hope it turns around. Yeah. Yeah. Fair. Um, just going through their draft picks. They have four draft picks this coming draft. They have their first, their fifth, their sixth, and their seventh. Yikes. Uh, but I mean, you know, again, team going for it. I get it. I mean, obviously, I think that's what your draft pool should look like if you're Edmonton at this point. Look at like your Edmonton. Look at all the first round picks you have right. accumulated. Like at some point, you know, it's time to actually 
it's time to actually go. Um, their prospect pool, uh, Scott Wheeler in 2022 ranked them 19th overall. Uh, some of their top prospects include Dylan Holloway, who uh, was brought in in game four. Um, Xavier Bugo, who plays for Schwinnigan, uh, and uh, Philip Broberg, who did uh, end up on the team this year uh, on the blue line. Um, so again, like they've got some interesting prospects, but again, like this team is past that point. Right. Well, you say that and, and I'm inclined to agree with you, but I think, I mean, think about the, think about the blunders they've made a lot the last couple of years. I mean, the one that specifically with draft picks, I mean, mm-hmm. the one that comes to mind for me is giving up two second round picks for Athanasiu and then not giving him a QO. Like yeah. to me, that's a huge blunder. And so with that in mind, I understand. I agree. I think where Edmonton is at, you know, they're past the point of needing draft picks. They are very much in a let's go for it right now kind of mode. But Too I bad do. Ken Holland's the guy at the wheel. <laughs> no kidding. But I do wonder if they. I mean, they've got their first this year, but they don't have their second, third, or fourth. I do wonder if they maybe try and find a way to get some more skin in the middle rounds. I mean, especially this draft is not ultra deep past the top half of the first round. So mm-hmm. maybe, maybe it's smarter for them. I don't know that they would, I don't know that they would consider trading their first round pick. I mean, they were pretty, pretty anti trading it all year. Um, and, and understandably so, but now we kind of know where, where, where things are going to shake out. I mean, they are picking uh 30th. Mm-hmm. I do. I do wonder if, if maybe they look at the way the draft is ranked like a lot of people have and say, well, I think we'd rather take our chances with two picks or three picks as opposed to one. And so I do wonder about that. I do wonder if maybe, maybe yes, he pulled RV is traded for a draft pick just to have more chances at it. You know, I, I, I do agree with you. I think draft picks should be the least of their concern, but I do at the same time think the way they've botched them the last couple of years, I think they might want a couple do overs. Yeah. Yeah. I think they just need a do over in the front office period. <laughs> right oh this team this team jay wood jay wood i don't know if this is completely unrelated to what we were mm-hmm. talking about but uh supposedly jay woodcroft this came out yesterday he's close to a extension yeah or, three years i guess not an extension i guess a contract because he's because he was not the, actually the coach <laughs> right i i think i think that's fine i think he i think he did a really good job i think um obviously he knows a lot of those players um, from his time in, in Bakersfield. And I, I mm-hmm. like Jay Woodcroft. I think yeah, he's, he's turned out to be a significantly better coach than I thought he would be. Because <laughs> I didn't really care right. for him as an assistant coach on the Sharks. I'm not going to lie. But he's turned out like, he's turned out to be a pretty decent head coach and good on him. Well, and and, and the way that, uh, the way that he was able, we talked about getting the most out of guys, right? The way he was able to, get more out of a Ryan McLeod, get more out of an Evan Bouchard, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the, you know, it's, you want your young guys to play well. I mean, they're theoretically going to be around for a long time. And I think the big thing that Jay Woodcroft did coming in as the head coach for Edmonton was taking some minutes. And I, I do believe play your stars a lot of minutes. I do believe in that philosophy, but the way that he gave his young players like Bouchard, like McLeod, more minutes and you know ostensibly allowed them to make a mistake and and have the time to work it out i think was a solid brand of coaching generally i think is a solid brand of coaching and it worked out for them i mean bush as you mentioned ryan mcleod put up a pretty decent season for edmonton and evan bouchard i mean that man you talk about a coming out party Mm. that was this year i remember when i was terrified that ryan mcleod was going to be the sharks draft pick i can't remember what year it was was it the (laughs) that would have been uh yeah 2018 so that yeah, would have been i was, mostly, I was yeah i was like just convinced i'm like oh god because this is before we realized doug wilson jr was 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 taking over and things had obviously gone a new direction because that would have been such a sharps pick at that at that number oh yeah the 40th ranked guy at 29 yeah 20. yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i mean that's that is our thoughts on the edmonton oilers anything else you want to add on edmonton before we so i guess us? you know the uh the title of the show yeah what's, what's next? next oh man what is next pain pain well no i don't know i mean it's they're still in the pacific 
The yeah. Pacific is that, still that, ass. It, That's a redeeming quality, if you ask yeah. me. Yeah. Yeah, because I feel like the one thing with the Oilers, right? And it, and I and I wonder, I don't want to take anything away. Look, they had a decent playoff run, but the second they had to play a team that wasn't in the Pacific, they got swept. Right. So well, I and just, I mean, you kind of look at the journey to getting swept, right? Mm-hmm. I mean they they got pushed around by LA way more than they should have. They absolutely. And then they, yes, they they beat calgary pretty easily but like kevin mentioned calgary was really soft and they crumbled i can't yeah i can't even i i still like calgary is going to be an interesting team to do sometime in the summer because like that's a team that i just i can't wrap around my head around what happened i was so convinced that they were gonna they were gonna feed the oilers their lunch like i was like oh yeah edmonton's gonna get to the first round because they're playing la and if they don't (laughs) then burn it to the ground and relocate them to siberia Right. And, and, you know, Edmonton, or I'm sorry. Yeah. Edmonton, you know, they, they got more wins than, than losses. Right. And so that's mm-hmm. impressive. They made it third round for the first time in the McDavid era, third round for the first time since 2006. It's an impressive season. It's a successful Absolutely. season. Absolutely. But as you said, the first time they had to go up against a Pacific or a non Pacific team, they got bodied. Yeah. And so I think my official declaration for what's next is, I think they do run it back. I I think the team is built really well. I think you run it back with what you have, but you need to build on top of that. You need, I mean, you need to get, get Yamamoto. Yamamoto was really good to finish the year. You need him to be really, you need him to be really good all year. Mm -hmm. And if you trade Yessi Pugliarvi, get something that'll help you right now. If you keep Yessi Pugliarvi, get him in a position where he is as good, you know, he can be good, consistently more consistently i should say mm-hmm. i think you know run it back with what you got at the top but those guys get them on track rebuild that fourth line specifically and tweak the i mean you know mcleod is fine pulley rv is fine but you know there's a lot of meh in that bottom six mm-hmm. and you need to clean that out i beyond nurse and bouchard and maybe if you re-sign Brett Kulak, I'm throwing a grenade on the blue line. And goalies, oh, trade for goalies. John Gibson. Yeah, I mean... Your only, that's your only option, if you ask me. Yeah. Trade for John Gibson. Trade for John... I just wonder if, how you make that... Again, it's like... Make Kevin, I mean, work, and right? here's the thing. Kevin hates Stuart Skinner. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Putting words in his mouth. But... <laughs> He's not here to defend himself. It's fine. Right. Kevin doesn't like Stuart Skinner, but a lot of people are really high on him based on what he did this year. Why not capitalize and have that be the centerpiece going back to Anaheim? Ooh, that's interesting. Yeah, because, I mean, I look at, like, I mean, free agency is going to be, I don't think I mean, do you, I mean, do you do, I mean, John Gibson is John Gibson. You're going to need to include some value. So, do you do Skinner, Pulley RV, 2022 first, and then maybe a Zach Cashian to help the dollars work out? Ooh, that's I mean, hefty. If I'm Anna, it is hefty, but it's also John Gibson. Yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah, if, I'm Anna, right. if I'm Anaheim, like, Zach, you don't want Zach Cashian, but, you know, the Anaheim really was sad that they had to trade Nick Delorier. And maybe Zach Cashian can be their Nick Delorier while they're not good. You know, I think, man, imagine Pulley RV with a Trevor Zegris mm-hmm. and Troy Terry. That would be pretty nasty. And then you have Stuart Skinner. You know, you're rolling the dice on maybe a goalie of the future because if the Ducks and, you know, if the Ducks do trade John Gibson, they don't have a guy who's coming up to replace him. Like it's John Gibson or bust at this point for Anaheim. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm looking at the free agents, and, man, it's pretty slim. Like, I wonder if, like, Mike Smith comes back, do you go with the oldest goaltending tandem in the league and throw in, like, maybe a slightly used Jaro Halak? Ugh. If if Halak didn't have a bad year last year, I would think about it. But he did. Yeah. I mean, Vancouver was also atrocious for... So, Aiden Hill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, I, I don't know. Like, I just wonder if, if like, if, if you're going to look in free agency, right? Uh, unless you're going to go, like, I don't... Is Mark andre Fleury going to go to Edmonton? Well, what about... What about somebody like Darcy Kemper? What about somebody like Jack Campbell? You know, those guys... Whatever you think about those guys, they were starters this year. Yeah. Yeah, I... Is, is Colorado really going to let go of Darcy Kemper right now? Well, I didn't think they were going to let go go of Philip Grubauer, and then they did. True. I don't know if they want to play that game twice, though. You know, and 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 you know, if you want to if you want to really stretch, you know, Darcy Kemper is from Saskatoon, which is nearish to Edmonton. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the topography is uh, similar, ish. I don't know. I've never been. <laughs> I don't. Yeah, I don't know. I, to me, yeah. I mean, obviously, I'm sure Marty, I'm sure Marty T is fuming right now at that comment. He's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna be. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens. Because I think you can't. You can't not address goaltending. But then again, I said that at last year's. You know, last year I said that for Edmonton. I said it at the trade deadline for Edmonton. <laughs> I feel like I'll just continue saying it as long as Mike Smith is your undisputed starter. Um, but yeah, I wonder if you know. I think you're right. Like I'm the way I look at it. Like could do a lot worse than 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 a trade for John Gibson if you can make that cap work. I just wonder what Anaheim takes from you. Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. I mean, if if they're giving up John Gibson, like I said, I'm and and if we're gonna play the role, if I'm gonna play the role of uh, Pat Verbeek, mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, Mister Edmonton, I'm trading you John Gibson. If I'm not getting Skinner and Pulley RV back, then I'm hanging up the phone. Yeah, I just I, I I you know what I I need to take a look at at Anaheim's goaltending depth because I just I look at this team when I think they're not as far along as the Kings are right but they're right there and I just wonder like I just wonder what the plan is like what do you do if you don't have John Gibson and I, and I don't know the answer I need to go do some some research on that because to me like when I look at some of the pieces that they have like in a, in a Zegris and you know what I mean like Troy Terry like do you do you just go all offense and no goaltending like i mean it got right. well, into the third round well and i and i think from anaheim's perspective as well you know kind of trying to make the case for pulley rv specifically yeah i mean and i like these players right like i'm a big max comtois fan i'm a big sam Steele fan mm-hmm. i would rather have vsc pulley rv over either of those guys Agreed. and the and the reason why i bring them up specifically is because you know Specifically with Comtois, there were whispers of, you know, maybe getting maybe somebody getting traded, you know, and and mm-hmm. I think you look at Anaheim, you know, they've got, you know, Troy Terry, Trevor Zegers, Mason McTavish, but there's still a lot of work there, as you said. And I think I don't know what Pat Verbeek's mindset is. I don't know if he's taking his time. I don't know if he wants to speed the process up. I mean, the fact that he accumulated a bunch of draft picks makes me think he wants to take his time. But yeah. if he does want to speed it up, like the best way you speed it up is getting, you know, instead of drafting young players and then establishing them, just get young players that are already established. And that's Pulley RV and that's Skinner. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. I, it's it's a good thing. I mean, it'll be interesting. I, I'm really looking forward to like far later in the summer when we when we go through the division, because I think Anaheim's going to mm-hmm. be a fascinating Know Your Enemy show. Um, I mean, and that's the thing, you know, we're we, little teaser. We've got a lot of fascinating stuff coming up. We do. Yeah, I got I got a whole folder of stuff that I'm we can talk about. I'm really excited. And again, little inside baseball for you guys. I'm really excited to do our goalie pyramid. Yes, that will be our next show. When our next show will be. I'm not sure. <laughs> to be determined. To be determined. But um, yeah, we're going to do like our. We're going to do like a either a pyramid or a ranking system of, of NHL goalies. And I think it's going to be a super, super fun show just to kind of change it up a little bit. Because again, like there's certain things like there's certain teams I think we're going to talk about um, as we go on. I think there's a bunch of teams that have been requested and we'll try and get to them as we can. But I want to change it up. I don't want to just be like, you know, just, oh, well, let's find out what's next for all the playoff teams. I think what's next for Edmonton, they're they're going to be fine because they play in the Pacific. They're their playoff team in the Pacific easily. Um, and again, it'll just be, what do they do when they get there? And, 
and how do they stack up against a you know how are they going to stack up against what what's likely going to be a very resurgent Vegas Golden Knights team uh, in the Pacific Division and how are they going to stack up to the other teams should they make it you know if they by chance for some reason finish in a wild card or you know finish first in the division somehow and then play a wild card from another division you know how are they going to stack up against those teams I think that's going to be the fascinating thing I think Edmonton's going to be an interesting team I think that Ken Holland um this team performs despite him um and that's just <laughs> the reality of it um, right. it'll be interesting to see if if you know if, if he can just kind of get out of his own way and and make some smart moves. Jury's out, though, man. Jury is out. Yeah. Uh, I think Edmonton reminds me a lot of Pittsburgh. Like, I think they've got a decent foundation, mm-hmm. but there's a lot of work that needs to be done, you know. Kind of some. I mean, specifically comparing Edmonton and Pittsburgh, the blue line needs yeah. help. The bottom six needs help difference being is Edmonton's goaltending also needs help so maybe Pittsburgh is a bit further ahead from Edmonton but you get my point I would take Tristan Jari over Mike Smith any day of the week oh absolutely um yeah so I I don't know it's it's interesting like it's it's funny because as good as Edmonton was like this is a team in the conference finals and like I'm I think they're a playoff team next year but you know and again we'll we'll come back to Edmonton in the know your enemy series but like I'm not really confident to say anything beyond that other than yeah, they're they're in the playoffs next year. But I not I'm not you know I'm not like this is a cup contending team next year. I'm not confident because I have no idea what this general manager is going to do over the summer. Right. But we will come back to Edmonton during the Know Your Enemy series, which will be uh, later in the summer. Obviously, closer to the season starting when we start running down all the Pacific Division teams, figuring out what they've done, and trying to figure out what we think they are going to do. Um, so, look forward to that. Looking forward to again um, next show. We're going to do our our goaltending tier list pyramid. Something it'll be whatever we can make puck guy make fancy graphics for. <laughs> um, you know, whatever makes easy graphics for Hawkeye is probably what we're going to do. Um, and I think that's going to be a fun show. And again, we just got lots of stuff planned for the summer. So I hope that you guys keep coming back. It's not always going to be just about other teams. Obviously when shark stuff happens, we will cover it. Um, so don't worry if you're wondering, like if you've been here for, you know, two shows now and you're like, wow, it's like two hours of just nothing sharks. I mean, tonight we kind of did have a little shark segue, but you would never know it by reading the title of the of the video. So don't worry. When shark stuff happens, we will be more than happy to cover it because, again, like, we are still a Sharks podcast, but we do like to talk about other things. I hope that you have enjoyed this show. Any final thoughts, Mr. Hockey Jerk? Yeah, so you said uh, you said that this was a two-hour podcast with no sharks. It's actually only an hour 15 podcast I meant with no sharks. To- both of them combined. <laughs> No, I know. I'm just messing with you. Um, final thoughts. I think the Pacific Division is still going to be a gong show next year. I think you're going to have a lot of teams who are vying to be the worst team in the league. That said, and I said it last year, and I'm going to nervously say it again this year, I think Edmonton will not be one of those teams. I think they'll firmly be in the top three. Uh, where they end up in the top three determines on uh, if if they listen to the podcast or not. Sounds there good. you have it. Final thoughts. I like follow it. me on Twitter. That's yes, uh, if you want to follow us on Twitter, you can follow me at Ian Bloggs Hockey. You can follow him at Hockey underscore Jerk. Um, again, follow us on Twitter. Let us if you have any ideas for for something that you would like us to talk about. Hit us up on Twitter. We will add it to our ever growing list of things that we would like to talk about that has been submitted by you, submitted by me, submitted by Jerk, submitted by Kevin. Uh, hopefully, Kevin will be back next show. He apologized for uh, not being here. And if you want to follow us, you can always follow us at tealtownusa.com. Go there. You can find all our stuff. Um, Obviously, look us up on Twitter um, as well as SoundCloud here on YouTube. If you're here on YouTube, please give us a like. Helps us in the algorithm and gets us up and showing with all the other uh, Sharks content that is out there. Uh, Leave a comment if there's something on the show that you think we missed or you would like to ask us whatever. Uh, Hit us up in the comment section. 
And if you want to know when we go live, because sometimes our schedule is a little erratic, be sure to hit the bell. It will let you know when we go live. Um, aside from that, that is this episode of Teal Tinted Glasses. We thank you all for being here. And uh, that's it. Good night.